Okay, we're now being recorded. <laughs> um, all right, uh, thanks everybody for making time. Uh, we know uh, it, it just seems like there's a million things going on right now, but so we appreciate everybody's time. Uh, Pam and I will try to kind of get through the items quickly and then make, uh, make sure to leave time for, for questions and, and discussions. So I guess we'll start with, it is 2.04 and we'll call the meeting to order. Um, we are virtual still, so we'll have to do uh, the uh, roll call votes. Um, so uh, with the, uh, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the, uh, just the two discussion items, the banking services and the budget? So is there a to approve? Okay. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I heard a motion from Randy, uh, Councilmember Haney, and then can I consider yours a second, Betsy? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Hey James, just a, just a real quickie. Yeah. I need I, I need to be um, out of the meeting if I just to let you guys know by three o'clock. Okay. So um, hopefully we're done by then. If not, hopefully any voting business is done. Okay. We'll okay. we'll make sure we get through it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, so we have the uh, motion uh, to approve in the second. Uh, I'll call the uh, three voting members. Um, uh, Member Olson. Yes. Thank you. Member Haney? Yes. I remember uh, Sticks. Yes. Thank you. Public comment. Um, I do not see anybody in attendance. And let me see if we have anybody in the chat room. <laughs> Are they chatting? No one, no one is uh, present. So if anybody comes in, we'll let them have their three minutes. Uh, but we can move forward to approval of, a min of minutes. Our last meeting was February 15th. Um, and so we do have the minutes in the agenda for that meeting. Uh, is um, any comments on those minutes? And if not, is there a motion to approve? Move for approval. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Thank you. And then I'll just keep roll calling. Uh, Member Olson? Yes. Member Haney? Yes. And Member Sticks? Yes. Thank you. So the minutes are approved. And that takes us to our first discussion item, uh, which we'll keep very brief. Um, it's related to the city's banking services. I think probably um, uh, Treasurer, uh, the Treasurer Steve Olson knows about this because I think he's been pulled into this maybe more than any of us were hoping to be pulled in. But uh, essentially, um, we're, we're having some issues with our bank. Uh, with some requirements that don't really make a lot of sense. And then as far as, um, uh, and then also some of the things that we're trying to do through our bank are be, like becoming uh, burdensome. Like, uh, let me see, I was gonna share my slide, but I guess it's brief. But um, for example, when we issue check payments and there's any sort of air, uh, the Bank of Sierra, who is the current bank provider, uh, they their process to fix those things are particularly burdensome. It requires like staff, uh, finance staff, to go into the system and like individually fix um, fix these errors that the that their payment system are sometimes creating. In addition, um, we recently had a new request from the bank where they asked for mine. Uh, Pam's and Mr. Olson's uh, credit checks that they wanted to run credit checks on us every year, uh, which uh, is interesting because, um, you know, one of the points that Pam and I made to, to them is like, well, let's say that somebody's credit report comes back with an issue. Like, what does that mean? Are you like not going to work with the city at that point? You know, um, and we tried to make the point to them that like the city council appoints, you know, myself and the treasurer. So like, why, like, why would you tell us that, you know, we're not able to represent the city, you know, and, and things like that. So it just feels like it's becoming like um, burdensome. Um, and there's these requirements that don't make sense and that require staff time or require extra effort. And so we aren't necessarily saying to change yet, but what we we talked about it, and we were thinking it may be time for us to issue a, a request for proposals to see if other banking providers would um, 
be able to offer services without some of these, you know, extra burdensome things. So, so we wanted to talk about that here at the budget committee level first. If whatever recommendation, if the budget committee uh, agrees and said, and you know, agrees that it's time to issue a proposal, we would then put it on a council agenda for the council to approve it, uh, the proposal. But we wanted to get feedback from everybody here. One of the comments I'll make, and then I'll open it up, but a lot of times, like, uh, and I know even when I first got here, I think we always wanted to have the local bank. And I think at that point, I forgot, it wasn't Bank of Sierra. It was, um, they had a different name before, I think. And, uh, but it was somewhat a local bank. Oh, hi, community bank. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So it was a local bank. And so, but we've like, when we've started to talk about this more recently and we kept saying, well, we need to stay local, we need to stay local. But the reality at this point is that, um, you know, I, I don't think that the Bank of Sierra is any more local than, you know, uh, Bank of Montecito or uh, Mechanics Bank or, you know, any, any of those. So I think that was the one thing that kept causing us to want to stay away from changing. But I don't know that that's as much of an issue anymore, but we wanted to come to the committee and get feedback on thoughts of uh, if we'd be open to changing banks or at least getting proposals. So with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, Council Member well, Haney. Let me give my, yeah, let me give my. Go ahead, Steve. Sure. Let me give my backup on that in that, um, you know, I did get pulled into it a little bit. And I think that we do need to have a bank that has a brick and mortar in the city of Ojai. But when I went and talked to them, I went, to the bank itself and talked to them and said that, you know, we have a problem with the um, credit check. And then basically at the local level, before we went up the line, they said, the person I talked to said, well, you know, you, that's what we have to do. And I said, well, you know, we're going to have to start looking, you know, another bank. And their comment was, that's what they all say. And I thought, are you serious? You're, you know, wow. And um, <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, we we'd like to stay with you. I have three accounts with them, and um, it, then we had the the phone conversation with. I think he was, I don't know, he was like a VP, and uh, he. He basically said the same thing. If if we don't sign that piece of paper, then we might look for business somewhere else. And um, you know, wasn't great community or customer service. I didn't think at that at that point. But the big thing was the I'm going to call it the check reader because you said errors. Well, they they're not really errors. It's just that the the uh, printer was printed off a little bit and they wouldn't accept it. Then they send them back to the city and the city is doing double time. So it's wasting city employee time to correct those uh, mistakes that should have been corrected at the bank. And, um, you know, I, I like local banks and I think we should definitely stay there, but it's not a very good situation right now, I don't think. You know, you know, James, I went to them for uh, um, what was the money that businesses could get from uh, uh, the federal government. Uh, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember. The I name. forget the name of it, too. It's yeah. been so long. But we went to them first because they were local and they turned us down for no for no seen reason. And then we went back to them again a couple of weeks later and it was the same thing. Um, when it was Ojai community, I think it had a different perspective on how they dealt with us. Mm -hmm. But um, they're no, you know, they're a branch of a bigger banking system. So I don't see any difference between them or Wells Fargo or Bank of America. I would think the most important thing would be dual custody on our end on deposits and dual custody on their end when they count our money. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than that, we're just running money through their machine and they're, you know, um, passing it on. It's not a, uh, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. For sticks. Uh, do you have your eye on another bank specifically? So, uh, it's funny. I wasn't going to pile on, but, uh, it's relevant to, to this is, um, uh, when, 
I, so we we would do a proposal, a request for proposal, and we'd see what we have. I think that um, Member Olson is is correct in saying that it would be really beneficial to have a brick and mortar locally. But uh, the bank that was actually very uh, good with us during the recession, that was actually willing to, the only bank that was willing to actually talk to us about loans and, uh, you know, um, was going to offer us a loan to get through the um, the pandemic was the was Montecito, uh, Bank of Montecito, which is why I had mentioned that one. And um, and so the second piece of this is we did approach Bank of Sierra for a loan during the recession or during the pandemic, I'm sorry. And it was like, uh, just like immediate no, you know, it just was like, it was not even, wasn't like we were, we had asked like, can we get in front of your committee and like, you know, tell them because I believe anybody that was very short-sighted because anybody who's paying attention would have known as soon as there was a recovery, the city would probably recover pretty well. And they just were not interested in, in talking to us. And then we went to Montecito and they said, uh, we would be open to giving you the loan if you'd be willing to move your, your accounts here. And, uh, and so at that time we were like, well, we're not looking to make that change, but I think, you know, it's just the difference between the level of service that we're seeing right now. So. And Montecito is over uh, by the high school. Uh, I don't know where the closest local branch is. I, I don't know I, that they are that close. I think that's the problem. Yeah, I think it's in Ventura. I think it's Ventura. So, so how does that affect us in, in moving money from um, from our facility to wherever we have to make a deposit? That would impact us, and that's why I think uh, uh, Member Olson's uh, correct to say we probably need to stick with the brick and mortar locally. Um, yeah, I just looked it up. Montecito has a branch in Ventura and a branch in Carpinteria. You know, Pam and I were talking. We uh, every week, probably twice a week, we have to deposit all the trolley coins, which um, is not fun. And I think we our our theory is it's kind of a pain in the butt, and we think that's why the Bank of Sierra wouldn't be too sorry losing us. You know, having to count all this change, um, but it's money. You know, so uh, uh, so but so anyway, uh, we would have to do that a couple times a week. So I think that's why having a local bank would be important still. So we probably would look at the three brick and mortars in town, maybe the one in Oakview. The other, other, the other issue that I've talked with Pam about is, you know, fees mm -hmm. that, you know, there's some of, of the brick and mortar that are in town that charge pretty high fees. And so I think, you know, that, well, obviously that will come through in the request for proposals. Yeah. on what yeah. fees are right. yeah and that's why i think we stopped short of saying like let's find another bank and we're just saying why don't we issue a request for proposals because then when if we go through that process and we get proposals and the fees are like you know crazy at other banks then we wouldn't proceed or you know we wouldn't recommend proceeding so. So. well you know i uh, um i've been at wells fargo for 30 years mm -hmm. Um, and I've had highs and lows with them. So again, I'm not married to anybody. Uh, I think doing an RFP and writing it towards what we need from a bank mm -hmm. and see if any bank wants to meet, fit our needs. Yeah. I agree. Yes, I do too. And uh, so is that the motion? Get, get, <laughs> get, get some good service. <laughs> okay, and I think that one we can do by consensus since it'll just be taking the recommendation to the council. So we'll proceed with the consensus that the committee supports um, at least uh, putting out an RFP and seeing what, what services are out there. Pa so. hey, Pam, one, one final thought. Pam, who did you guys use in Oxnard? Um, it was Wells Fargo for the majority of the um, process. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then um, I'm sharing my screen. So that's that was the first item. And then the second item is the budget, which I'm looking at the clock and I want to make sure we save time for. So I'll, I'll try to move fairly quickly. Um, but we wanted to come to the committee um, 
the last couple of years have been so volatile and back and forth and you know closures and all these things that we wanted to kind of come uh, before the committee and just give kind of the big picture general overview of what we're expecting this year and what we're assume uh, the budget assumptions and and the um, uh, revenues that we're expecting and proposing. And so it's our first uh, budget discussion of, of the year uh, of, of this uh, round. So it uh, seems like we were just uh, talking budget, but um, but I think overall, before I start getting into it and so that everybody's not in suspense, I think that we're looking at uh, pretty optimistically a like a, a good recovery here. And that's kind of reflected in, in the um, numbers that we're projecting here. Uh, the last couple of years were, you know, we started out the budget with how, how much do we need to cut to survive? I think this year will be, you know, where do, uh, as we recover, um, what priorities do we kind of focus on first? And so we put together a budget that shows that recovery. And then uh, that includes the things that we think that the city council will want to um, focus on and, and, uh, and uh, start with the recovery with. So, so this first slide is the big picture. Uh, you can see from, from here that our budget over the last couple of years had dropped to as low as having less than $10 million in, ex in uh, expenditures. Um, the revenues uh, picked up. So that year that we had made a lot of cuts, we actually ended up with a surplus, but you can see that the revenues dropped from the normal levels of about $12 million pre-COVID to $10 million uh, the first year of COVID, $11 million the second year of COVID. And we're looking at ending this year up to about 12.2 million. We budgeted very conservatively each of those years. So uh, besides 1920, where COVID hit at the end of the year and we weren't expecting it, the other years we were able to make enough reductions that we actually project uh, that we're ending each of these years with a, with a surplus. And so uh, we'll talk about the reserves in a minute, but I think we're making starting to make progress in rebuilding the reserves from when we were really impacted uh, early on. And so for this year, what we're showing, what we're projecting is uh, a continued recovery from last year's 12.2 million, uh, or 12, closer to 12.3 million in revenue to about 13.1 million in revenue this year. And we'll go through the big three revenues to explain why that is in a, in a moment. But the other thing you'll see that'll probably jump, jump out a little bit is we had cut uh, to, um, from the prior, the, uh, we had cut the budget down to under 10 million at one point and, uh, and back to about 10 million over uh, uh, last year. And so this year we're starting to re like um, fill some of the vacancies, fill some of, uh, start, um, implementing, re-implementing some of the contracts and things. So we are showing right now on the first draft of the budget uh, about $13.1 million in expenditures. And so it's fairly balanced. We'll have to make a couple of adjustments to get completely balanced. And then obviously if any um, additional uh, projects or purchases are, are desired by the uh, council, then we'll have to uh, move some things around to keep balanced um yeah James, before, before we move can we can i just review these numbers in my head i just sure. uh, let's let's go covid 2021 mm -hmm. and so our um total our projected revenues coming in were ten thousand uh uh 213 and the actual came out to 11 million 392 am i correct no so uh, almost but so this is 1920, and so 2021, we, we aren't showing the projected amount here. So, so the 10.2 is what the total revenues for 1920, and then 11.4 is the total revenues in 2021. Okay, uh, okay. And, then, and then our actual expenditures were in the red, correct? And well, so yes, so what we're- left us, That left us a surplus of 2 million, correct? 888. Correct. Okay. And that went automatically into the reserves? Yep. Okay. 
So now we come into 21-22 fiscal year. So it started out June of 21, it goes into July mm -hmm. of 22, correct? Yes. And you're projecting in revenues 12 million 200, you're projecting in expenditures 10 million yep. and another $2.2 million. Yep. Okay. That um, I believe council has directed it to go into um, refurbishment or uh, replenishment of the uh, reserve. Yep. yep. Until we get to 50%, it's required to go to reserve. Okay. All right. And so you're projecting for 22, 23. So you're projecting the revenues coming into July 1st to be around 13 million. Yeah. So slightly up from this year. So you're showing an additional $3 million, sir, 2 point something million dollars in expenditures. 2 million, is, yeah. Is that what you're gonna talk a little bit about or yep. what those expenditures are? Yeah, okay. exactly. And the, the, the short version of that is we cut everything to get, you know, and, and it's like interesting because looking back in hindsight, a lot of people would say, well, why did you cut so much? You ended up, you know, fine. But we didn't know that things were gonna recover when we were at that point. So we had to cut and, uh, you know, we were at one point when the uh, businesses closed, we were down to our last $700,000. So we cut and we cut until we made sure we were, you know, gonna get out of it. And so the good news is the last 12 months have been like really solid. And as you see, like that helped us come out with a surplus over the last two fiscal years. But so we'll talk, I think you hit on it. The key thing right now is going to be explaining why we think the revenues will be up and then explaining what those additional $2.1 million in expenditures are. So, okay. so we'll start with the revenues. Um, these are the assumptions that we are making to explain why we think the revenues will, will um, be up from last year, uh, from up from 12.2 to 13.1, so up another $900,000. To come to that conclusion, we had to assume that there would be a continued recovery from the pandemic and no additional rounds of business closures. So obviously what we mean by that is if there was another surge in COVID and businesses had to close, our, you know, our projections are gonna be too high. Uh, we're assuming that that's not going to happen at this point. And I think that's a fair, I don't wanna jinx us, but I think it's a fairly safe assumption. It's most of the, um, like public health leaders and things like that have said that they don't anticipate additional rounds of closures. So, so uh, we also have only the current hotel hoteliers. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have a, a hotel that's um, going to planning commission tonight that is uh, scheduled to reopen, but we, because we don't have a date yet, we did not include uh, the impact of that hotel in the budget. Uh, I would expect, I think their rough estimate was that it'd be about a million dollars a year in additional hotel tax revenue. So if we look back a year from now and, and they have reopened and their hotel tax has been contributed, uh, then our, our revenues will probably be much higher than we're projecting. But we are still being fairly conservative in that we aren't, into, like, we aren't counting on that happening yet. So. Uh, Next for cannabis tax, um, we had last year, we had just issued permits to the two manufacturing businesses. So, uh, and this is a good example of why we don't, we're not counting businesses before they reopen this year is we had issued permits to two manufacturers and they said they would reopen this year and neither opened. And at this point, when we reached out, neither could give us a date that they were gonna open. So when you look at our hotel tax in our budget worksheet, it looks like we overestimated by $120,000, but the reality is it's because we were told that the manufacturing businesses were open and they didn't. So next year, we corrected that by dropping it back down and assuming that the manufacturing businesses don't reopen, uh, which is a drop of about $100,000. Uh, we also expect most cities are seeing right now that as people keep cutting the cord of cable and going to streaming services, that the franchise fees keep dropping and we think that'll continue to happen. So we reflect a drop in that in the budget. 
Um, we also don't include any major operating changes. Um, you know, one of the conversations a lot of people are talking about right now is whether the city could potentially partner on Sewell Park, for example, in some way. We don't include any costs related to anything like that because it's just it's at this point nothing is you know um, pending. So, uh, and then lastly, uh, one big chunk when you look at the budget and it went up by two million dollars from last year. One big chunk is we're putting back in the transfers that we had cut out when things got tough. So for example, the transfer where we take a big chunk, 20% of the hotel tax and we send it to CIP for, for paving and project. We had cut that out last year to help kind of drop our expenditures. This budget assumes putting that back in at 10%, which is about $450,000. So right there by itself, that's 450,000 of the 2 million in new expenses. So I, I wanna mention that because I know, I think people's reaction when they see, so last year we managed to cut down to 10.9, why do we need to go back up? Well, we had cut down to 10.9 by deferring a lot of things. And so this year is trying to catch up on deferring now that we're out of the, out of the woods, uh, so to speak. So, uh, we'll go through revenues a little bit more closely because um, like we said, the revenues were projecting to go up. You can see, I think looking at this chart, you can see that the revenues I think are pretty reasonable. Um, they had dropped from 8 million before COVID to 7.4 in 1920, 8.4 in 2021 as they started to recover. This year, we're projecting 9.6 million in tax revenues. So that's up another million. And then next year, we're projecting to go up another 300,000 to 9.9 .9 million. And so I think that's still fairly conservative, but um, they, you know, inflation and everything went up so high this year that I don't know that we're going to see another million dollar jump next year in, in tax revenues. So I think that, that that's a fair estimate. The big three tax revenues, every, I think everybody kind of knows this, but it's our property tax, sales tax, and hotel tax. The, the trends we've seen for each of those three over the last three or four years, property tax grows very slowly. Um, I think people think because houses are selling for record highs that the city is gonna get like record revenues, but we get such a small chunk of that and the bulk goes to the county. So we they property tax each year that these housing prices have gotten crazy, we only get another $100,000 a year across the whole city in property tax. So we're projecting another $100,000 steady increase on property tax. Sales tax has been flat. Uh, just, it just uh, has been. And you know, on one hand, you hear about like the brick and mortar stores going out in other cities and things. So in some ways you think we're lucky that we've been able to just like kind of maintain, but they've, they, we've just consistently had $1.8 million a year in sales tax. So we're pretty much projecting those to stay flat next year. So if you're doing the math, property tax and sales tax aren't really going up. But what has gone up like crazy over the last two years is hotel tax, uh, which had dropped down to 2.7 million at one point, but uh, went back up where we're projecting it'll end this year at 4.4 million. So the big increase when we talk city revenue the only thing that's really increased like that has been the hotel tax and so this year we're projecting it'll go from 4.4 million to 4.6 million and that's you know we've had conversations with a couple of the hotels they're seeing really good occupancy right now the rates have gone up but uh and people think it'll stay steady but they are also saying they you know there's not you can't really if they're 80 percent occupied there, that can't keep going up very much because there's not, there's not a lot of room there to keep going up. So I think we'll see that still continue to grow, but it won't be another million dollar increase like last year. So those three are the big tax revenues, which is why we're projecting. Uh, so again, I guess I should have shown this, but the reason it went up a million from here to here is the hotel tax went up. And then the reason why we're projecting it going up another 300,000 from here to here 
is we're projecting the hotel tax to keep going up. So, so it really is going to come down to you know if the hotel hotels keep um, keep performing at that level. You know, so James, the, it's, in, it's interesting how a lot of people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. um, imagine if the end closed. Yeah, well, just people close don't. your eyes. Just close your eyes and and yeah. take the end's TOT out of our budget. Yeah, we saw and, what, and then think of the conditions that we would have to provide services under. Been yeah. there, done that. Yeah. Pardon? Luckily, yeah, we Jeff did that Bezos, for almost three years. Jeff Bezos is coming back in September, though, right? He had such a good time, <laughs> right? Well, we saw it happen. Unfortunately, there is one month during COVID that Pam and I still shake our heads when we look. When the, the, all the hotels, including the inn, were closed. And the city's total revenue for that whole month was six thousand dollars. So you know, it's just you know, like I the joke I keep making is if we had to live within our means and we only brought in six thousand dollars, we would have one part-time employee for the city, and we'd have to close all the facilities. That's pretty much what we can afford. Yeah. So, way to go, yeah. Pam and James. You two are did an amazing job. Well, what, what it comes down to is it just it's just people need to recognize how important TOT is. And, um, and if you don't, um, then you don't recognize how the city functions. Well, I think the, the other part to that too, that a lot of people don't realize, and I think it's because the city's never really explained it very well, but when we started really digging in, the, the biggest sales tax um, uh, payer is also the inn. So I think people think like, okay, the, the inn brings in the $3 million, but all the, you know, the 1.8 million in sales tax comes from all the other businesses, but they're also the biggest sales tax provider, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good point, Randy. And it's also, um, we've all realized how important having reserves mm -hmm. is, you know, I mean, it went really fast and, uh, you know, who knows when there's, going to be another time when the inn shuts down for some reason yeah, yeah. no i don't disagree yeah. again it's just it, it's you know that's the i know it's i'm i know i'm the one that wants to, to leave early but you know it's the same thing that goes on with that t-bid is the t-bid was missed um used lack for a better term um during during its duration yeah and had we kept it and recognized all the things that we could have done. We could have done traffic studies. We could have done parking studies. We could have done air studies. We could have done all types of studies with that funding that we never recognized that we could have. We always thought it was not only used for sp specific things. It wasn't until that argument came up that we started looking into it. Now we never, we didn't win the day and, and that's okay, but we're using other monies and other resources to do these studies now where we have the ability um, to actually have people that are coming outside of our community that are using our resources, paying for studies that would help us fix these problems and issues that occur being a tourist-based economy. Mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, I always bring it up because it's just, it's sad to think that we threw that, that money away. Instead, somewhere in here, when we get into expenditures, you're gonna, we're gonna see where we have to use money to do this study or money to pay for this or money to pay for that. Yeah. So I think in the interest of time, I won't go through a whole lot here other than I'll say the rec program is probably the one thing that stands out where that had really dropped because we you know, couldn't have rec programming. We built it back up and about doubled revenue in a year. We're projecting it to increase even more. And I'm actually, I think this might be a little conservative, but I know they're also staffing up and trying to get instructors back. So we were, we decided to be a little conservative. And then uh, unbeknownst to us, we just got a word that the school district's gonna offer free summer programming, which will probably impact our summer programming. Uh, so, uh, so I think that uh, we're projecting that to keep coming back, but maybe not as, um, strong as we had hoped it would. Um, last, uh, the last thing I'll mention on this slide is that we have received the first of the COVID funding assistance payments, 893,000. We are uh, supposed to receive the second and, um, and the rules on those keep changing. 
we literally just got another uh, update on how the rules have changed again. So we may end up having to bring an item to council to discuss how that can be used depending on where they end up with the rules. So right now, we, we know that there's like $1.9 million, I think is, is what it totals, or $1.8 million uh, coming to us, but it's still unclear of how it could be used. So we aren't really factoring that in uh, uh, completely. So that's why we show revenues here. And then we have a separate line for the revenues with the COVID funding. So, so when we talk expenditures, um, like uh, uh, Council Member Haney noted that the, there is a, we're projecting a, a big increase in expenditures and um, our, I, I should say, kind of return to normal expenditure levels. Uh, we mentioned earlier a big chunk, which I should add to the slide is the um, $450,000 going, transferring to the CIP for paving and those types of projects. Um, we also are reinstituting, uh, we, the uh, prepayment of the retiree medical, uh, which is um, that $100,000 prepayment, we keep prepaying to try to uh, keep those costs from, from uh, uh, going up long-term. Uh, we also have, uh, I think the big thing for us is it's starting to fill the vacant positions. We had had uh, about a quarter of our positions vacant. I think it was seven of 28. Uh, we're vacant, that we pretty much maintained vacant throughout the pandemic. We finally filled three of those over the last um, uh, month or so, including uh, starting uh, yesterday, our new public works supervisor. And so um, we have, we've started to fill those. We have four more positions or so that we still want to fill, uh, that we're still getting ready to fill. And then I am going to recommend a couple of changes or adjustments to the city council. One will be, um, we had wanted to add one additional maintenance worker just to kind of increase the level of, of, uh, of work. But um, with us taking back the uh, buildings at city hall and wanting to uh, put more work into the campus and the demo garden and Stewart Canyon, uh, I'm planning to recommend two additional maintenance workers, one to do that, and then one just to be, you know, general city uh, support and, and to increase the quality across the city. Uh, and then we have a rec uh, employee who's been with the city for many years who um, helps to operate the gymnastics program. And um, with some of the changes there, we've, we're looking at trying to convert that person to a full-time position. Uh, if, if the council approves the budget. And then um, uh, we had a contract planner and we've been, we've been struggling with contract planners, but all cities are struggling with contract planners right now. You can't find them. And then when you find them, they're not the quality you're hoping. So we're proposing reallocating the funding from that to actually hiring a part-time planner, which we had good luck with uh, last year when we did that. And then um, with uh, the uh, with a department potentially moving into the Oak Tree House to give us more space at City Hall, we would want to hire one part-time office assistant to um, to interact with the public at that building. So, so these are uh, as far as staffing adjustments; those are the ones that we're proposing in the budget. Uh, and then, just I'll go through these quickly, and then uh, we'll get to questions and things like that. But um, we're also looking at adding some uh, more senior focused rec programming. Uh, Recreation is saying they're getting a lot of calls asking for that right now. Um, maybe because uh, the other places that the seniors used to go isn't like aren't offer offering those right now. So we're looking at adding some senior programming. So we've included some some um, funding in the budget to get the staff or the um, instructors to do that. Uh, in the budget right now, we're proposing $103,000 for community funding. That's what's built into the current budget. That's down from last year's $200,000. Uh, and so that'll be a key question, both that we'll ask the budget committee for input on, and then that we'll, uh, that we'll ask the council for direction on, is if we want to, um, uh, what level we want to do community funding this year. We also have uh, $31,000 built in for um, public outreach materials, translation services, and OHI Day. 
We have 50,000 built in for a website update because we have our new uh, public information officer and um, we have a, we're putting together a plan to update our website, the city's website. Uh, another big chunk in the budget to explain the $2 million increase, we're building in a $450,000 contingency. And that is the largest contingency we've ever built in, but it's because we expect uh, right now we're, we're expecting, anticipating about $250,000 potentially towards the water litigation. Hopefully we end up, um, you know, coming to an agreement with, with all the other parties and that's avoided, but we're putting that in as a worst case scenario so that we have the money there if we need it. We also still, uh, we put in $400,000 to, to complete, uh, this should be the last year of the general plan update, which was has been a little bit delayed by COVID. So that's another chunk. So again, when you're talking about that $2 million increase and you look and there's 400,000 here, for, uh, in general plan update, 400,000 for contingency fund and 400,000 for uh, the TOT transfer. That's already a, a big chunk uh, of that increase. So it's, and those are all, they aren't like, it's not spending because we have money. It's like doing the things that we had deferred or put off in the tough years, you know? Um, we also have the uh, contractor to provide engineering support and public works for the paving project. Because uh, we're expecting to do the biggest paved project we've done probably ever in Ojai, is what we're we're proposing. We have money in the budget for all the different audits we need, which it seems like every week there's another audit that the state or the federal fed, the feds are requiring. Uh, we also have put money back in the budget for the first time for training. Uh, that was cut over the last couple of years. Uh, what we're trying to do is create one budget for training that will, could be used uh, for the for those who need it. It could be used for either you know staff, the commissions, or the council. Whereas in the past we gave each person each one their own line item. We're creating just a, a fifty-five thousand dollar training budget so that we can send the priority training uh, folks who need it. So, and then the last thing that we increased is every maintenance budget. So parks maintenance, tree maintenance, streets maintenance, we increased them this year um, because every maintenance budget, we had to cut little by little over the last couple of years uh, when times were tough. So we're proposing putting those back into the budget and, and increasing those to higher levels. Um, again, we had to defer for a couple of years. And so we're trying to treat this year as the catch up year on, on all those things now that we've had a couple years of good um, revenues. And so this is, a, uh, that was kind of the high level. This is a little bit more just the line item, but I think the important thing to, um, to uh, uh, see here, it just reiterates what I mentioned. Salary and benefits, we show, uh, we project going up with the um, four additional positions filled. And then, um, and then filling some of the our uh, the four vacant positions filled, and then the uh, a couple of additional positions, the two maintenance workers, um, and then uh, the other um, thing that goes that shows higher here is the um, uh, like I said, the deferred are the the maintenance. Uh, we have dropped those from three thirty five before COVID to 237, 233, and then started to build it back up to 286, but we're proposing this year to go higher on maintenance and, and we're proposing 405,000. And James, where do you account for uh, police services, the police uh, contract? So police, police services uh, on this chart, um, it's we have it in our budget. I don't know, Pam, do we show it in this chart? Is it in departmental operating expenses? That's oh yeah, that's where it shows up in our worksheet. Okay, so it's so it, we didn't forget it. I just yeah. I didn't yeah. see it as a line item, and I was just concerned that's yeah five million dollars unaccounted for. That's right here, and uh, it is we what we're budgeting this year is three point three seven million. Okay, and I will say uh, Pam's getting breaking news at the same time as everybody else here, but I just talked to the um, sheriff's department, and they said. They are projecting 5% increases next year. 
And so I believe, Pam, I guess you can confirm that we we did budget a 5% increase, assuming that's what they were going to do. Yes, we so, did. Yeah, so that that should be in here. Hopefully, you know, uh, with without any unexpected surprises, that should be about right. So, so those are the expenditures. Um, quickly, I'll go over. Uh, and I, I see I'm running out of time, so I'll really make it quick. We wanted to put a chart together because Measure C was so slow to get started because of all the closures, where we only got fifty thousand the first year and then one point seven the next year. But the last two years have been strong, 2.2, 2.3. So total measure C revenues are about $6.2 million so far. We've only spent, spent a small chunk of that uh, so far. We spent 880,000, but we have pending projects like the street paving, which we have a million dollars towards. Um, and so uh, we are, and then we're recommending keeping kind of $1 million in the fund so that uh, we have a, like a million dollar reserve there so that if anything unexpected happens, we have uh, the money as needed. So we expect when we go to council to talk measure C that there'll be about $1.8 million left that can be programmed into projects. But uh, a big chunk of that uh, it will probably already be um, in the CIP, but, it, but the council will either approve the CIP or swap projects. So. Um, but so the good news, though, is it's really starting to make an impact and build up. And that's what's going to let us have our, our largest uh, paved job that we've had. Um, and so last thing, and I know I'm going through a lot very quickly, so I apologize. But um, a number that we've never really talked about. All right, all right, let me start with this. I think the general budget picture right now, I would say, is a very is a pretty positive budget, all things considered. We're able to to kind of restore our service levels. We're able to keep going on priority projects. We're able to, to build, we're rebuild the reserve. We're able to, uh, we've done a couple of things like prepaying the, the um, OPEB liability. So we're still like, we're paying the bills that we should be paying. But the one bill that we've never really looked at or talked about in, in Ojai is the, what they call unfunded accrued liability for pensions. And what that is, is it's like the portion, uh, and Pam can probably explain it better, but when we pay towards everybody's, every employee's pension, but there's a portion, uh, or but we're, we're not paying the full cost of their pension. So every year there's like a portion of that pension payment that is unfunded. Um, and so like, uh, as an example, I think we pay about 500, um, like well, like here, five hundred ninety-two thousand dollars in a year for all of our employees' pensions, but the total is really like seven hundred and ninety thousand. And so every year, and this is true in almost all cities, is that that balance keeps getting bigger because you every year you're not quite paying all of it. And so this is what's caused a lot of cities, like um, you know, typically bigger cities, but. This is what has been the cause when some of these cities have declared bankruptcy and things like that is when the, the, they discovered that the unfunded liability, especially if you have thousands of employees, you know, is you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so it's not really a huge problem in Ojai, so I don't think we've ever really talked about it. Um, we had one presentation last year where I had uh, the, the pension guy come in and do a presentation, uh, but we've never really looked at it that closely. But so we wanted to talk a little bit about this this year because uh, we just wanted to make sure everybody's kind of aware of it and we start thinking about you know, how we can address it. Uh, as you can see here, the key numbers is what is our unfunded liability uh, pretty much uh, you know, at end of last fiscal year is about $5.6 million. So, that means even though all of our other numbers are looking pretty good, we're rebuilding the reserve, we still have a $5.6 million debt, you know, kind of out there that nobody's really paid attention to, or I shouldn't say paid attention to, but we've never, we've never come up with a plan to address it. And so that number at the end of 21-22 will be 5.9 million. And again, it just, like I said, every year it, it 
basically keeps growing little by little until you come up with a, a plan to address it. Um, the latest estimate from PERS is that if we just kept paying the minimum payment, we would pay it off by 2048. Now I'll say, so 20, 26 years from now, I think that estimate is like too rosy because that's assuming they get a certain amount of their investments every year and, I, and they never do. So I think it will be longer than that, but that's their latest estimate is 2048. And so we talked to our contractor we have on our PERS, um, our PERS liability, and we asked them what would happen if we paid $100,000 extra a year towards this, just like we pay $100,000 extra a year towards our OPEB liability. And they say that uh, if we paid $100,000 extra, we would pay it off in 13, 13 years faster in 2035 instead of 2048. And so, um, uh, and, and so that's important to keep in mind uh, the impact that prepaying an additional chunk would have. It's basically like you know prepaying a mortgage essentially. And then we wanted to call that to attention. And then the other thing is we got the five year or maybe it's six year uh, estimate here for like what the city will be paying each year in the meantime. And so our annual payment that's included in the budget this year, uh, there's a line item for it is, um, is $592,000 this year. Next year, it's $495,000. The year after that, four sixty-six. dollars So they're projecting a little decrease, but then in the long term, it starts to go back up into the 500s. So uh, in other words, we have this kind of looming debt out there that we're paying. We're paying the minimum payment on every year, about half a million dollars. And we'll be paying it till 2048, unless we want to start kind of attacking it. So, so Pam and I are still working on that. We've been working on that even uh, last night, trying to kind of get all these numbers figured out. But we're, we're considering proposing uh, that the city council start a fund to prepay this uh, starting this year uh, with, with the additional $100,000. So, but that's not, that's not in the uh, budget right now because we're working on it. So that would be another um, $100,000 in expenditures. So. Hey, James, could we have a budget meeting um, as soon as you and Pam can put it together just on this subject matter? Yeah, it might be good. Uh, you know, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions about what's funded, what's unfunded. Yeah. And looking at your percentages, I don't know how something could go down. I would assume that they would constantly be going up. But and that's why I don't want to drag this committee meeting into that. But I think if I have uh, Steve and Betsy's um, okay to maybe have a discussion, just, you know, maybe we make it an hour, we just set a time frame on it and, yeah. and go over this just by itself. And we, uh, we actually, we got the, we got a contractor who does these forecasts for a living. It's GovInvest, as you, their names on here. They did these charts for us and everything too. And so, um, it's funny, Pam and I talked about that yesterday. Is maybe we should have the GovInvest person come and like walk us all through it. So we could do that if everybody is interested and have a you know a, our budget committee meeting where we walk through it with GovInvest. You, you know, from a business sta standpoint, I don't know how how we get away with not paying these um, annually. I don't know how we're allowed to defer a couple hundred thousand dollars and then let it build. I'm lost on that from a business. I'd love for the state of California <laughs> or, or any of them to say, Randy, don't pay all your taxes this year. Um, you know, I'm lost on this one. So I need a better understanding. Yeah. So we could do that if, uh, if every, if everybody is on board um, and, you know, we, I, I want to get him here and uh, kind of walk through it anyway. So, but so anyway, so that's kind of the budget in a nutshell, I would say, I know I threw a lot of information, but I think it's generally positive. We're showing that the, it, all that stuff we deferred for years, we're trying to catch back up on. And so it, that, that's reflected in our expenditures going up, but we think that it's fairly balanced right now. And I think that our revenues are, are fairly conservative. So we feel pretty good that we'll be on track and we'll be able to start catching up on things. And so we're open to any questions. Um, we wrote down some questions that we wanted to get everybody's feedback on, but I know um, 
we only have a couple of minutes. So if, if, if anybody has any questions first, we can um, we can take those. Uh, can I, I just want to confirm that the priorities for Measure C money, uh, clearly paving and then climate and trees, correct? Well, so I mean, the, that's... the priorities are set by council. So, right. uh, <laughs> so, so uh, I, I don't know that we, so the council had said, here's like the categories that we may spend on and that those were them. But, but then it's like the council never said, because we didn't have the money coming in yet, they never actually said, here's our priorities on this. So this year will, I think will be the year we have to have that discussion because we do have like uh, $2 million in pending projects and a million and a half in new projects we can do. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm guessing we'll have that conversation. We included um, paving as a big chunk. We also are recommending starting a, a, a little fund to do electrification of our buildings, especially right. now that we have multiple buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the pending projects that carried over were the electric trolley and we're working on our solar panel install at City Hall. So we're trying to make sure we get those projects, but I think um, uh, that'll be, the second budget workshop will be kind of the whole list of projects, and I expect different. You know, the council members will. Uh, no, not this council. Their priorities. <laughs> Fantastic, James. Thank you so much, and thanks again, Pam. And you know, once again, you pulled off a miracle. <laughs> Thank you. People just don't know how close we were to closing the door. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it's it's interesting, but I mean, we knew that if we could get through it. Like our goal was get through it and recover quickly. So I think it's gone the way we were hoping it would go and that we wanted it to go. So I think, you know, but it's, you know, there's a couple of things for us like paving I wanted to have done about six months ago. Well, we delayed it a little bit because we weren't sure we were gonna have the money to do it. And so we're gonna get ramping up to do it now, but like, you know, hindsight's 2020, I wish uh, we, if we knew how this was going to end up, we probably would have been a little more aggressive on a couple of things, but we're we, in an okay spot. We, we also have, like you said, some funds that we haven't accounted for. Mm -hmm. We've got almost $2 million, I think, out there that we didn't account for in, in revenues. Um, if El Roblar comes in, if the 800 and some odd thousand from the federal government, mm -hmm. um, if, we, uh, if these cannabis people um, get their stuff together, and we as a council raise their taxes, we could generate some more revenue there. Yeah. You know, they're still the, the uh, contrary to their belief, they're taxed the least out of any city in the county. Yeah. Um, so True. it'd be interesting to see uh, if we move them to Main Street, if we're gonna increase their taxes mm -hmm. as we do that. Um, yeah. But I'm thinking we got $2 million of unanticipated revenue that will help us down the line make some additional decisions as well as um keep adding to the reserves you know i was thinking about the reserves after uh, betsy made her comment but i don't know how many years it took us to get to close to four million and how many years has it taken us to replenish it two years three yeah. years at the most it's pretty yeah. incredible but it took a long time to get to get those reserves up to where they are today yeah. or where they were pre-COVID. And that's the thing, I, I, you know, it's funny because I, I, I was expecting somebody at the council meeting might say, well, that was easy to rebuild the reserve. And the only thing, the only point I will make is it was not easy. We cut to the <laughs> bone, you know, to rebuild the reserve. And we got, we cut to the bone and then we, we did get lucky. Revenues came roaring back. And so that period where we had cut really hard and then the revenues were coming in, that rebuilt our reserve. But I think uh, that was not easy. And then, I mean, we have items that come to council where people ask for, you know, $4,000, $5,000, $10,000. And we've had to say no for the last, you know, 18 months. That's not fun either. So, so we've had to make hard decisions, but it put us in a really good spot now coming out of it. So what percentage is it right now, James? Uh, Reserves. So we, our updated estimate is that we are at 4.9 million. And so here's the challenge with reserves, just to let everybody know, because our reserve is 50% of expenditures. So this year, if our expenditures go up, that means the goal goes up. 
So the last year when we were at 10 and a half million dollars, 4.9 million would have been almost 50%. We almost would have done it. But this year, if our budget is 13 million, 50% is six and a half million. So we're 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 a million and a half short, you know. I, I think we need to review when that policy was put in place and read the fine print. <laughs> and maybe they said 50% of this year's budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've, we've already exceeded it. <laughs> well, the only thing I'll say, it's funny, I think Steve remembers this, right before COVID, we had a budget committee meeting and we talked about, eh, maybe like 50% is too high because, you know, what are the odds we're ever going to have like a complete shutdown? And then we did. So I think coming out of it, I've learned the lesson of like, because the idea with having 50% is if there's a complete shutdown, you can survive six months. So that's because it's 50% of a year. And we saw this time, there was a point there where we had to survive for five months, you know, and that's, and that's how we were able to do it, so. One more, right. you, you, <laughs> go ahead, Steve, sorry. James even had a date to where we were gonna shut down mm -hmm. at that point, I remember yeah. during meeting <laughs> i know that was that meeting yeah it was just, i felt like i was the bearer of bad news but i think <laughs> alan alan rains ended that meeting with saying he's seen worse and that made me feel a little bit better <laughs> well on that yeah. note james how much how much time did the town shut down quote unquote during the thomas fire during the thomas fire it's interesting i think whew, Remember there was the fire and then there was those couple weeks of just like the brownest sky you've ever seen. I think it, I think it had shut down. I would say it was probably like a month, you know, but then, I mean, we saw things like the Oaks never reopened to this, you know, to this day. So it had long, longer impacts than people realize. So. Okay, thank you. James, how long has the unfunded PERS liability? I mean, it seems like I remember that years and years ago yeah. it's it's been constant right i mean we've never ever caught up yeah exactly. any other city for that exactly. matter. exactly yeah that's the thing is you know that's why i don't want to like sound like i'm trying to scare everybody because it's like that we've always had that debt out there it the closest thing i could think of really is a mortgage you know it's like you you buy your house and you just know for 30 years it's hanging over you and uh every city has this hanging over them uh, but I think for us, what we, we got that contractor with the idea of getting him to be able to model, well, could we pay it off and how quick can we pay it off and what would it cost to pay it off? And so, um, you know, uh, we pay $500,000 a year. If we're okay paying $500,000 a year until 2048, we might not need to do anything extra. But for me, the idea of paying $100,000 a year extra and actually paying it off in 2035 and from 2036 on, they'd have you know half a million dollars in savings a year, probably more by then with inflation. Uh, it's, it seems like it might be worth the, the investment if we can afford it like years like this year, so. Yeah. Have we ever thought of, of uh, making the payment that's due in full? And then look at what it's going to take, or, or is that already included in what we're doing here? No, so that's is our obligation five hundred um, without is our obligation five hundred ninety two, and um, and then to reduce that balloon payment of five point or six million dollars down the road, that we're going to add a hundred thousand to it. Is that what we're saying? That's what I'm suggesting. And but to your point, it's funny because your question was the one I asked yesterday when we talked to the uh, person is. We found out that because PERS sends us a bill and it has this number on it. And so we were asking them like, well, how does the number keep going up if we're paying the payment every year? Right. Goes, well, because the, the real number is like 200,000 more. It's like 792. And I'm like, well, why wouldn't they send us a bill that says 792? And then it's up to us if we want to pay 792. Right. Or so this is part of why we wanted to have the discussion though, because I think for years, we received the bill and we thought like, oh, we're, we're doing our part, but we actually could have been doing more, you know? So, okay. so we could schedule a, a meeting though, like probably you asked uh, how, or you said, uh, you know, to do it when we could do it. And I think probably we'd be able to do it like a month or so out where we could meet with the, um, the unfunded accrued liability consultant. We're meeting one more time before we present the final budget to council, correct? 
Well, so the way we've typically done it is we have this first meeting with budget committee and then we present a first proposed budget to the council. So that is currently scheduled next week, but we go to council three times, proposed budget, uh, CIP, and then final. So we usually do a second budget committee before the final budget. Right, that's what I thought, okay. So we need to meet on this sometime before CIP. I think I think so. I think around the CIP. Okay, I think great. they meet on this and, and then we'll do the final budget because we'll have feedback from council too at that point. Okay. All right. Thanks so, folks. I have, I'm have i gonna run to another meeting. Okay, so I think- Thank you, Randy. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks Randy. Bye. Bye. All right, so did anybody else have any any uh, questions or concerns? James, I have a question. Sure. Um, there, I realize that the council is going to appoint someone to fill my position on the on this committee. That's right. And I'm aware that only one person turned their application in before the deadline. Correct. What is, is there a policy on what a, about the other people that turned in their application not uh, after, really. the de after the deadline that was posted in the newspaper? Yeah, not really. So we uh, we pulled the policy because I think it is going to be a hot topic. Uh, just I'm getting that sense. But we pulled the policy for the budget committee, and it says basically follow the procedures that we follow for other commissions. Right, I know that. Yeah, and so. Uh, the procedure we follow with other commissions is when somebody submits their application by the deadline, we forward it. But when somebody has submitted their application after the deadline, we forward it, but we note it, we notify the council that it was submitted after the deadline. Okay. Because ultimately, it, it, these are all council's appointments. So it's up to council if they want to say we should appoint the person who followed the rules or we are not, you know? Right. So, so, um, we ended up getting three applications. Right. And uh, the uh, plan right now is to put them on the council agenda, agenda April 26th. And we'll know what date the deadline was and who, who submitted it on time. So I, you know, I, we'll see how that goes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that's going to go at this point. I, right. Well, we're, we're looking for somebody who's good with numbers who can follow a schedule, right? <laughs> that, that might be. Uh, it's, if I was hiring, I think that would be an important component. <laughs> All right. So, so anyway, so that, that's kind of the plan, but we were, you know, we talked last meeting and we were like, oh, we'll bring it to the budget committee. But I think you actually were the person, we said, we knew that it was written, the procedure was written down somewhere. And I think you found it and sent it to us. And so that's where we- Oh, that's of, right. Yeah, so, right. so appreciate that. So. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. It was a nice right. meeting. Thank you. Thanks for everybody's time. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Thank you, James. Bye. 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 Bye.